Well, good morning. Good morning. My name is Matt Hadlin. I'm the senior pastor here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, and I welcome all of you who are here in the sanctuary and all of you, the more of you, who are worshiping with us via live stream. This is a special day. Our church's membership is going to grow at the 1030 service. This is Ascension Sunday, but it is also Confirmation Sunday. And here at this service, we're going to catch a glimpse of uh, some of our young people as they help uh, lead us in parts of our worship experience. But if you're at home, I invite you to just worship God fully and wholly this day as we join together uh, in this experience. There is one note for those of you who are in the sanctuary with your, with your bulletins there. You can see on the back our pictures of our confirmands. And we have a tradition here of writing letters to our confirmation students. And if you haven't yet written a letter to our confirmand, we're going to leave the envelopes here for one more week so that you have an opportunity to uh, get those words out. But for those of you in-house, there is a misprint on the telephone number for our joys and our concerns. We do take prayer very seriously here. And so you are invited, whether at home or here in the sanctuary, to text in your items of prayer, 414-331-2691. And when it comes time to the prayers of the people, we will hear them lifted up before us. And so let us worship our God as we begin by worshiping with song. I invite you to stand as you are willing and able and enjoy this musical offering. take our seats. Why don't we turn and wave to one another? That is our passing of the peace in these days. And you know, there was some exciting news from the CDC and we and our church leadership are going to talk about what that might mean for us. But I invite you to be seated and we have a time for our children and uh, we're going to have some of our confirmation students in this video to help lead us. I think so. I have my goggles on. It says we're supposed to pour some water into this cup. Got it. So I'm going to put the water in here. 
And now we're going to put the salt in. Where did the salt go? It's still there. It dissolved in the water, even though you can't see it. Don't believe me? Just taste it. Gross. It is still there, even though you can't see it. This reminds me of the ascension. You mean when Jesus went back to God after the resurrection? Right. Just because Jesus went to be with God and they couldn't see him, it didn't mean he wasn't going to be with them anymore. That's right. Jesus is still also still with us. We can't see him or talk to him or play with him in the way that we can with people who live around us. But he is still here, just like the salt was still there, even though we couldn't see it. And just as the salt changes the flavor of the water, so Jesus' love changes the whole world. Jesus is in us, and when we love others, they can taste the love of Jesus dissolved in our lives. Wow, I think you might do well on this chemistry lab, Jacob. I should pray, just in case. Oh God, we thank you for the knowledge that Jesus is with us all the time, even though we can't see him. Help us always remember that he is near to help us and guide us every day. Amen. Man, I am so thirsty. What's this? Mm. Uh, you know, it's a, not a good video unless there's a spit take in there. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And so if there are children that want to go to our Sunday school class, uh, Jacob is, or Andrew, Jacob's dad, is here uh, to help uh, guide us. And uh, we, we saw that, uh, you know, in a chemistry lab, he said, well, I better pray. And there's always been movements to keep prayer out of public schools. And I had a friend that had a bumper sticker that said, as long as there's tests, there will be prayer in school, prayer in school. But no prayer uh, makes up for studying first and doing the hard work to make sure you know your... your uh, your materials. And so come on kids and let's continue uh, worshiping our God this day.
Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Lord, you are the word of God, the author of creation, and your love indeed reaches all the lands. As we remember today your ascension, we admit it seems so recently that we celebrated your birth. For the many lessons you continue to give about how life is meant to be lived, we are grateful. And we pledge to remember your teachings and to respond to your summons to deny ourselves and serve others in your name. Oh God, as you have lifted up Christ to reign with you, lift us up to be with you as well, for we need your reassuring presence in our lives. Lift us up to be with you because we need courage to live boldly as your witnesses. Lift us up to be with you because the world is dying for your wisdom to bring about reconciliation and peace for all nations and peoples. And today we especially ask that you lift up our confirmands whose journeys in faith are just beginning. Bless, O oh Lord, we pray, those whose needs are great in their families, in our community, in our church, and our troubled world. Especially bless those who are named aloud now in the joys and concerns of our congregation today. We give thanks and praise for the saints who've gone before us, including Betty Brandt, and for all of their heavenly birthdays. We lift up prayers for Nancy Batchelder and her heart procedure today, prayers for her dad in hospice in Baraboo. We pray for ICU patients and their recovery. And we pray for Carolyn Bolton, who fell and is experiencing severe arm pain. We ask the Lord to provide us guidance as we see glimpses of the end of the pandemic in sight. Help us learn how to best navigate re-entry into a COVID-safe world. We lift up prayers for Ellie Henley and all the other members of our congregation who graduated from college this weekend. Thanks be to God for all the opportunities our children have had to receive the best education. We give thanks that they're able to pursue their dreams and study courses of their choice. Make all of the graduates instruments of your will. Finally, we lift up prayers for a marriage that's struggling and for the courage to find forgiveness each and every day. These are the prayers of our people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And hear us now as we join with all who walk in Christ's ways as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come to the time in our worship when we give back to God from the many treasures and blessings we have received. Those of you who are in the sanctuary are invited to leave your offerings in the box by the door. Those of you worshiping at home may send in offerings, go to our website to give, or use your smartphone to text the number you see on your screen. We have a mission of the month every month uh, when we uh, accept loose change or other designated offerings to go to a specific mission cause. And in the month of May, we are supporting the work of United Methodist Children's Services. So you may write a check or give cash in an envelope with just UMCS on it, and we will know that you are designating that for the work in the uh, neighborhoods surrounding United Methodist Children's Services in Milwaukee.
Well, we come today to an account from the book of Acts. And Acts was written by Luke, the same man that wrote the gospel, Luke. He was writing to a friend named Theophilus, and, and he was, uh, his whole mission and goal was to set aside an orderly account to tell it as it really, really was. And a lot of scholars, you know, believe that Luke's gospel is the acts of Jesus, but the book of Acts is the acts of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit who is going to come on the day of Pentecost, which we will celebrate next Sunday. You're all invited to wear red as we celebrate the flames of the Holy Spirit coming down. But we know that Pentecost gives us the birth, the growth, and the spread of the church. We know Jesus has been crucified. We know he has been resurrected. And he's he's made some appearances to these disciples as they are are still there in Jerusalem. They're, They're waiting. And so we turn to the first chapter of Acts, starting with verse 4 and going through verse 11. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is... Is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they, they, they still don't get it, do they? They still think this is going to be an, uh, an overthrow of the Roman government. He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, in last week's sermon, we heard Jesus uh, as a part of his farewell discourse, and we talked about some of the painful goodbyes that we have had to say to individuals, and I encouraged us to never take any goodbye for granted because you never know if that's the last time you're going to see that individual. But today, we have what, what we might call the mic drop moment. Do we know what a mic drop moment is? Somebody just finally just does, says the right thing or has the right performance. They just take the mic and they drop it and they walk off. In this case, the mic is dropped and he is lifted heavenward. And his mic drop moment is this. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, where they already were, and in Judea, well, that's okay. And Samaria, where those people are, and to the ends of the earth. For these disciples, their world was pretty small, but now it is being opened up to everyone. And then he's gone, taken up in a cloud right out of their sight, a cloud that, that is reminiscent of the cloud that led Israel through the wilderness, the cloud that, that was there at the mountaintop at Transfiguration. And so we call this Ascension Sunday, when the Lord ascended. How many of you have been to Jerusalem, been on a trip to Jerusalem, and and they take you to that site where the Ascension happened, or a site very much like where it would have happened is their catchphrase? When when we were there, it was fascinating. It was a human experiment in in psychology. We're there, and they're, they're telling the story of the Ascension, and every single person there looked up. Now, what we were looking up for, I have no idea. To see if this was the day he was going to come back down, there was something about us. We had to look up. But friends, the leaving of this world, the way Jesus did it, is almost as inexplicable as the way he came to us in the first place. Amazing how it happens. And so John Buchanan, in an article, wrote that modern Christians stumble all over this event, trying to take it literally, to understand it in terms of space and time. But, he argues, the idea it represents is among our most important and most precious, that being he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God. Every time we recite the Apostles' Creed, we 
we mentioned that statement, and at, at the confirmation service, there's going to be a lot more people here at 1030 for confirmation. We're going to hear that Apostles' Creed, that affirmation of faith read to us by one of our confirmands. But what is it saying? It says that God is not dead. Jesus is not dead, but is alive and is sitting at the right hand of God. Jesus is, to say, the authority, the final authority. And that is good news, that he is the final authority, that it is not sickness, it is not suffering, it is not injustice, it is not oppression, it is not racism, sexism, or any ism. No, not even death. Jesus Christ is the final authority. And that's what ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God really means. And it's at the very heart of what we believe when we believe in this good news. You know, when it happened, wherever it was, the disciples were confused. We would be too. You know, if, if one just was lifted up in our midst, we would be confused. We would be amazed. We would be astonished, just like they were. And they couldn't believe what they were seeing as they, as they, were, were, as they watched him go up. And then suddenly there's these heavenly visitors. They said, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you looking up? Your job is not up. Your job is here, in the dirt, with the sweat. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up to heaven? It's time to stop staring and time to get going. It's time to stop pondering eternity and start thinking about the work of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Time to stop whatever you're thinking about withdrawing from the world and recommit yourselves to living fully in the world. And the text continued, then they returned to Jerusalem. They did not go off to pray in a desert. No, they, they stayed right there. They went to work, the work of a disciple. To the ends of the earth was the challenge. And that statement could not be more clear. Jesus wants his followers. Jesus wants you and I to be right here in the world. Jesus wants his people of every age not to try to escape from the world, to transcend the world, but to engage the world, to live in it thoroughly, to live their lives fully in the world, to love the world just as God loved the world, to respect and to honor and to serve the world just as he did. And yet many of us are still just looking up in the sky. Maybe you've heard that cliche, so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. We are here to do earthly good. In the world, it is where the followers of Jesus are supposed to be. It's where you and I are supposed to be. The world with, with all of its messiness and violence and, and even its corruption the world is still the object of God's love. The world is where God's people will live and work and love and serve and, yes, play. And Jesus promised the world is precisely where we will find our joy. It's where they would find their joy. In this event, the disciples had to learn that Jesus is no longer here to preach the good news Jesus is no longer here to heal the sick. Jesus is no longer here to feed the hungry. The mission now falls to the disciples. It falls to you and me. When I was in seminary, my mind was opened up to reading many of the classics, these, these words of God's men and women throughout time who, who so eloquently are able to articulate their faith. And one of the ancient... Uh, people that we read was Teresa of Avila, who lived from 1515 to 1582. And in one of her prayers, she wrote, God of love, help us to remember that Christ has no body now on earth but ours, no hands but ours, no feet but ours. Ours are the eyes to see the needs of the world. Ours are the hands with which to bless everyone now. Ours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Maybe we've heard that. I know that there's even hymnody written around that. There is no body now but ours, our hands, our feet, our eyes. Friends, we have inherited a call, the same call given to those men that were just staring up into the sky. Ours is a call to go from place to place, 
where we gaze into the clouds to the places where Christ, where, where the world needs Christ. Yes, we are called to be the hands, feet, eyes, and voice of Christ to the ends of the earth. And one of the things I love about this community of faith is that we understand that our real mission and ministry doesn't take place within these walls. No, we are called to engage beyond these walls, and we do. We have literally sent our people and we have supported other people who have gone to the ends of the earth with good news, with good works, with the love of Christ. We are called to love. We had a funeral here in the sanctuary, although I don't like to call it a funeral. It was a celebration of life, and it was a celebration of a life that was lived very well. It was the celebration of Betty Brant's life. It has been a part of this church for decades, and we really were under a time crunch because the, the family that came in from Michigan didn't have the opportunity to stay till Monday for the burial, the committal service. And so we had to be out at the funeral or at the cemetery by 3.30 or, or I don't know what the or would have been there. Uh, but so we gathered. It was just the immediate family. And, you know, I, I went through my typical committal service and I, I said, you know, we didn't have an opportunity to do all the sharing that we wanted. And it was maybe intimidating to say some words about grandma or mom or, or great grandma. Is there anyone here in the family that would like to say a few words? And there were some beautiful words spoken. And then one of the daughters-in-law uh, said to uh, the rest of the family, did you know that Betty was multilingual? And I was like, I, I read her obituary. I didn't get any of that. And, and they, the rest of the family just kind of shook their heads. What do you mean Betty was multilingual? She was many things, but I, I didn't know she was multilingual. And then this daughter-in-law said, you know, an author, Dr. Gary Chapman, wrote something called The Five Love Languages. And it was originally written for husband and wife or partner and partner, but it has been expanded, these five love languages. And that's what made Betty multilingual in the eyes of her family. The love languages, words of affirmation, saying supportive things, and they could all remember some supportive thing that Betty said. And you and I are called to love the world with words of affirmation, making the world a better place with their positivity. She also spoke the language of service, acts of service, doing helpful things. One of our Methodist tenets that our confirmands certainly learned and have taken to their heart is one of our three rules is to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with God. Acts of service, and they shared ways in which she had been in service to them she also spoke the language of gifts, the giving of gifts that tell others that you were thinking about them. And uh, Sue Stanley, I think, stunned the world when she got up and talked about one of the gifts that Betty gave her once she and Tony became engaged. Betty Brandt gave Sue Stanley a teddy just before the marriage. If you don't know who that is, for those of us that do, it was quite a statement. It was quite a story. Betty spoke the language of quality time. And friends, when we love, we're not just supposed to swoop in and throw money or throw food. We're, we're supposed to spend time. Perhaps the greatest gift, the greatest language of love is to spend time with one another. I did a premarital session uh, just yesterday for a couple that's going to be married this summer. And we were talking, and, and they talked about how the world of the pandemic has has had them spending a lot of time together. Even though they both work uh, crazy hours, they've spent a lot of time together. And, and the fiance, the, the young man said, you know, I can spend uh, 24 hours with Brittany and, and feel like I want to spend more, like I didn't have enough time with her that day. The gift of time. But the final language that made Betty multilingual in the eyes of her family is the, the, the gift and the language of physical touch to be close to, to give hugs. And, and we've had a year where giving hugs has not really kind of been a thing, and I'm, I'm kind of a hugger. I, you know, we, we've even had to kind of go away from shaking hands for the time being, which is why when we leave, we kind of give the Easter elbow to one another as we, as we depart. But these languages of love that Betty was able to model, that's, 
That's the call for all of the disciples. It It is the collective work of everyone who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is the work of love. And as Luke tells it, he is less interested in the event as a personal one, this this ascension of the Lord. But it is more important to Luke that they understand that they receive this together and that they are to model it into the world, into the future. It is this event that sets the stage for the birth and the growth of the church. This risen and ascended Lord says no to the disciples' eagerness to talk about the restoration of the kingdom and to establish a calendar date for the ways of God. They are instructed instead to wait, to wait, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and to go about their business as witnesses to this Easter faith. Easter faith. Every morning is Easter morning from now on. We need to live out as Easter people. But as I mentioned, this is a confirmation Sunday. And confirmation sets the stage for the birth and growth of the church just as this event did. And, you know, Pastor Andrew, uh, when we were interviewing, when I was interviewing him the first time, he said he just despises that statement, the church or the children are the future of the church. And says, no, they are the church now. And so we realize that confirmation is not a finish line. It is something far different. And so each of our confirmands had to come and to uh, write a faith statement. So rather, I'm going to invite you to come on up. Every, every confirmand was invited to write a faith statement to talk about what their faith means. And I wonder, when you were 14, what kind of a faith statement might have you actually given? And so Riley gave one that was uh, pretty good, and we've asked Riley to share it with us at this service. So Riley, can you just introduce yourself to this congregation first? Who are you? Where do you live? How'd you get here? Um, Hello, I'm Riley. I live on the other side of this wall right here. (laughs) Um, I think I've been here for nine years, pretty sure, or eight. And I've been um, coming to this church almost like every week. Almost every day, it seems like you're in this building. He is the son of Dan Murphy, who is our building manager. And uh, so, Riley, um, you're going to go off to high school next year. And because you live on the other side of this wall, that means you're going to uh, Whitefish Bay High School. Are you you excited about that? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All right. He seemed pretty eager about that. All right. So, Riley, and as Riley is sharing his faith statement, and some of you in my Wednesday uh, small group uh, heard it. I read it to them. I hope that's okay with you since you're going to give it to the whole world right now. Um, But again, what kind of faith statement, what kind of truth would you bring to this exercise? So go ahead, Riley. Okay. Um, So we are supposed to write our faith statement. This is something that I've tried to avoid for some time now, and I can no longer put it off. I can list all the church activities that I've participated in the past nine years since my dad started working here at the United Methodist Church. Wednesday Night Lives, choirs, musicals, plays, Journey to Bethlehem, rummage sales, pumpkin sales, delivering Advent packets, confirmation classes, the list is long and will continue to grow as I do too. Our faith statement is supposed to be a comment on our journey. For me, I find it hard to sum it up. For me, I've had a good start, but feel that I am not at the end more in the middle. This journey isn't over at the end of my eighth grade of school. My dad says he's still on his journey and still has many questions. I'm guessing that will be the same for me. All I know is for sure that I'm loved by many people at the United Methodist Church, but most importantly, I am loved by God. I know that I'm less than perfect, but I know that God loved me, and that's all that matters. I have some great memories and plan to have many more to come. Thank you very much, Riley. And I hope it's not just the middle, because I hope you're going to have a long life to be able to live that out in faith. Can we just show God our appreciation for work speaking through Riley? You can return to your seat. And so these five young people who are going to be confirmed and brought into membership this day, these, these new church members and confirmands all around the world are the ones to keep the mission and ministry moving forward. Riley said, all I know for sure, and like those disciples who, who really didn't quite get it yet, they, they were watching Jesus depart from them, 
they really didn't get it. But Riley said, and I'm sure those, those people would agree, all I know for sure is that I'm loved by many people here at the United Methodist Church, but most importantly, I am loved by God. I know that I am less than perfect, but I know that God loves me, and that's all that matters. And so, friends, I want you all to know that God does love you, and that really does matter. It's all that matters. But what matters beyond that is that we are called to respond to that love, not pie in the sky, but right here in the nitty-gritty, doing the faithful work of disciples. May God strengthen us by the power of the Holy Spirit to do just that. Amen. And so I invite the praise team to reassemble as we sing Lion and the Lamb. And so we heard the call today to be active in mission and ministry in the world, that Jesus is gone, that, that the Holy Spirit is going to come and empower us to do that. And so we want to 
give us opportunities to live out our faith. And one of those ways is by protecting our church. And we have our annual church charge conference tomorrow night. There is a, a, a link in Zoom, uh, a Zoom link on our website, and it was put out before. You can also find it on our homepage. We have an Empty Nesters event, an in-person event on Tuesday, May 18th at 6.30 on the front lawn of the church. The weather is supposed to be good. Let's hope indeed it is. A young professionals group, uh, the same thing, except for they get to go to a beer garden, the Estabrook Beer Garden. Hope the weather is good. Uh, we have our Women Offering Worship, a, a new book study by Anne Lamott. Uh, you can ask Nell if you have any questions about that, and it's going to be held outside at the Buxton Garden, a beautiful uh, place to just sit and to to uh, speak with one another. And we have, uh, again, we already heard the call to wear red to church next week. But if you want uh, to join us out at Clody Park, you can't miss us. We're going to have a red tent. We're going to have the red pinwheels that uh, signify the breath of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and just bring a picnic. We're going to be out there after the uh, 1030 service. And again, we're really hoping that, that everything is, is well. And again, we heard a call that we have done such a good job of giving clothes and supplies that they don't need any more clothes, but they do need brand new undergarments uh, of the larger sizes. And so we thank you for the ways in which you give. And so friends, we are about to depart out into the world that needs us to be the hands and the feet and the eyes. But before you do that, I invite you to remain seated and to uh, experience our confirmation class of 2021. Thank you. 